All right, so in this particular lecture of the reproductive system diseases and disorders, we're gonna focus here first on the male reproductive system diseases, and then we're gonna follow up to like some of the STDs and trauma and that kind of thing that can happen with both systems, or both systems, with male or female. So looking at the male reproductive system diseases, we have first what we would call prostatitis. This is gonna be where the prostate has become inflamed. So the prostate gland is a gland that kind of with the urethra makes like a donut and so the urethra flows through the center and so if this was to get inflamed and, and swollen, it can actually put pressure on the urethra as it tries to go through and could kink it up. And this is what causes a lot of the common symptoms here, where we have dysuria, where they have pain with going to the bathroom, as well as potentially pyuria, which is pus. We also see that they will start to develop a fever because this is a lot of times due to like a urinary tract infection and low back pain. The cause is kind of unknown, but we do see that there is a relationship between like urinary tract infections as well as certain STD infections that might be present. Now with this, when we look at treatment, treatment is going to be antibiotics as again, it could be due to an inflammation with bacterial infection, um, warm sits baths, increased fluid intake and analgesics for the pain. Now with preventative measures, one of the big things is making sure you have a good water intake so that urine is constantly being processed and passed through. Um, watching for urinary tract infections and catching them early so that they can be treated, as well as having good proper hygiene, especially for those who are uncircumcised because if they're uncircumcised, a bacteria and things can develop a little bit more in the folds of that foreskin and it could cause more chances for UTIs in males. The next one we want to look at is benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH. This is an enlargement of the prostate gland due to normal cells overgrowing and enlarging. That's what the hyperplasia is. They're getting bigger, they're getting enlarged, they're growing too much, and they need to be addressed. Now again, the cause for this is unknown, but it is common in males over the age of 50. And so it has a relationship to the aging process. Now, symptoms include nocturia, where they have to go to the bathroom a lot during the night, inability to start urination, weak urinary stream, and inability to fully enter their bladder. So they have a lot of problems with going to the bathroom, okay, when we look at benign prostatic hyperplasia. Now, with this, we do see that treatment is going to be prosthetic massage, Sits baths can be helpful. Um, catheterizations may need to be done to help to empty the bladder, especially if it gets to be too full because we don't want the bladder to actually burst. Regular sexual intercourse can actually help as well. And then surgery might need to, need to be done. Now, surgery here is to resect or decrease the um, tissue of the prostate gland itself. This can be done through the urethra and they call this a transurethral resection of the prostate where they can remove a piece through that opening. They don't have to actually open you up. Okay. No surgical incisions are technically needed. Okay. So this one is looking at the benign. Now, one way to help with preventative is to constantly or annually get prostate exams, especially over the age of 40. When males are over the age of 40, this should be something that is regularly done to help catch enlargement of the prostate early rather than late when it's already very enlarged and causing difficulty with the urinary system. Now the next one is prosthetic carcinoma. This is where a neoplasm of the prostate gland develops. This is a cancer of the prostate gland. It's going to affect males over the age of 50 most often. It's the second most common cause of cancer related deaths in males. So this is a big deal. It needs to be checked out. And this is again why prosthetic exams are important after the age of 40, where you're getting them on a regular basis. Now the symptoms are very similar to what we saw with BPH. There's not a whole lot of difference. And so again, getting the prostate checked is one of the main ways to look to see if it is BPH or if it's prosthetic carcinoma. Treatment here depends on the age. There could be an issue with the physical condition of the individual as well. And if the cancer is actually metastasized, there would be different ways to look at this. A lot of times if this develops in men that are way older, 
it might be too risky to actually do surgery and chemotherapy radiation on those individuals. Their quality of life would be decreased greatly. So there's a lot of factors that have to come into play when we talk about treatment. Now, treatment might involve hormone replacement, and in this case, they would give estrogen in order to counteract the testosterone levels in order to help slow down the, the development of the cancer. Again, surgically removing this could be part of the, the treatment as well, along with a combination of a type of medication like chemotherapy. Now, prognosis with this is pretty good because the cancer tends to spread pretty slowly. And especially if it's caught early, we do find that 50 to 75% of affected individuals live five years or more after diagnosis. Next, we have epididymitis. This is inflammation of the epididymis. And so guys, the itis on the end tells you it's inflammation. When we look at this particular type of inflammation, we do see the common cause could be inflammation of the prostate, urinary tract infections, mumps, and even some STD infections like chlamydia, syphilis, and gonorrhea. This is one of the most common diseases of the male reproductive tract and system. And we do see that symptoms include things like swollen, hard, and painful epididymis, which would be in the testes, and severe scrotal pain and swelling. Now, treatment, guys, treatment needs to be prompt, and we need to give the appropriate antibiotic therapy if it is due to a type of bacterial infection. We do see that if you delay potential treatment, it could cause scarring and issues with fertility later. Um, a big thing with this is rest is a big part, as well as analgesics, helping control the pain and discomfort. Um, they may need some help scrotal support because gravity obviously pulling them down could cause that to be sore and more painful. And then avoidance of alcohol, spicy foods, and sexual stimulation during that healing process. One of the best ways to prevent this is, of course, sexual abstinence. If that's not possible, using protection and also getting checked regularly for STDs and proper treatment of those STDs if they're present could help prevent the development of inflammation of the epididymis. The next one's orchitis. Orchitis is an inflammation of one or both testes, and this is due to a viral or bacterial infection. So this a lot of times could be caused by viral mumps is one of the most common. However, it could also be caused by other bacterial type infections. Symptoms include swelling, pain, and tenderness of one or both of the testes. We also see that the patient will develop fever and have malaise. Now, treatment with this, guys, is going to be antibiotics if it's bacterial. So doing antibiotic treatment in order to get the bacteria under control. However, we do see whether it's bacterial or viral. Bed rest is important for the patient as well as analgesics, painkillers, um, antipyretics to deal with the fevers and even scrotal support. If it is viral though, guys, it has to be able to be defeated by your immune system. So we're just giving the body support in order to help with that fighting, that battle with the virus. Now, since this is most commonly a complication of the mumps virus, we do see that vaccination for the mumps helps decrease the risk of this greatly, as well as doing preventative infections for STDs can also help with the bacterial side. The next one we have is testicular tumors. These are commonly going to affect young males, specifically between the ages of 20 and 35. They tend to have the highest risk for this. It's the most common type of cancer in this particular age group. Now, symptoms of testicular tumors are painless masses that are felt within the testicle. Now, this is a big deal because it doesn't really hurt. And normally when we talk about going to the doctor, it deals mostly when we ha have pain or discomfort, but they do find that there is a mass that is present. This is commonly accompanied to what we call cryptocortism. This is what you see in the picture where the testicle might not have fully um, descended like it is supposed to during early development. It could have done it later in life and this could potentially increase the risk of development of testicular tumors. We do see that it could also be due to a potential inguinal hernia that happened as a child. 
Now, when we look at the treatment, guys, surgery is going to be one of the main treatments. This is going to be an orchectomy. This is followed by chemotherapy and radiation. Okay, so they're going to take out the testicle. They're going to do chemotherapy and radiation. This procedure leaves the unaffected testes, so they leave the testes that's not effective, and the male is not rendered sterile or impotent as long as one of the testes is still functional. Now, metastatic testicular cancers can be treated with radiation surgery, of course, removing both of the testes and the lymph nodes in the area can, pre can prevent it from metastasizing. Um, well, males wishing to have children might actually elect to bank their sperm before the removal of the testes in order to be able to father children just obviously through artificial insemination that would need to be done and approximately 90 percent cure rate when we talk about testicular tumors okay because if we remove them we catch them early not much of an issue now, this cryptocorticism is an undescended testicle that happens. This is common cause with, with premature births in males. Um, the main treatment here is just surgery to pull that testicle down into the proper area in the scrotum. That's the main type of treatment. The big issue, though, is that if this is present and we do have surgical intervention, we need to be aware that the higher risk of testicular tumors could occur. And so we would want to watch for it that. All right, now this brings us to sexually transmitted diseases or STDs. A lot of times these are also now caused sex called sexually transmitted infections or STI. They were formerly called venereal diseases. Okay, um, STDs sound a little better, but they're still not great. Um, this is a group of many diseases that are spread by intimate or sexual contact. And so this is where they get their name. Um, treatment is commonly going to consist of identifying their sexual partners. This is again like contact tracing. We want to figure out where it's come from and we want to let people know that it potentially has been spreading. And then we need to treat the infected individuals uh, concurrently. We need to get them on treatment plans as quick as possible. Again, to prevent more individuals from being affected. Prevention of STDs is best achieved by avoiding intimate contact with infected individuals. And so again, abstinence is the best way. However, a lot of STDs can also be prevented by using safe sex practices with condoms, but that's not 100%, okay? Now, we do see that some of these include things like AIDS, um, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is a li linked to a sexually transmitted disease. Specifically, it is going to be the virus of HIV. HIV ultimately will progress into AIDS over time. This is also a bloodborne viral infection. And so sexual intercourse is not the only way or sexual contact contact is not the only way this can be transmitted. And this was talked about back in patho one, if you'd like to look at that, specifically in the immune system chapter. We also see hepatitis. Hepatitis is a viral infection of the liver. Hepatitis B and C can be spread through sexual intercourse. And these were talked about during this particular patho two, when we talked about the liver diseases with the uh, digestive system. So you can also take a look at that one as well for a closer look on the hepatitis. Now let's get into some of them that are specifically just affecting the reproductive system. So we have here genital herpes. Genital herpes is a viral infection of the mucous membrane. The cause is by a herpes simplex virus. Now, herpes simplex viruses are not just found in the genital area. They're genital herpes when the sores and the symptoms are in the genital area, but you can also get these in your mouth. We call them cold sores. And they can also be found in any mucous membrane that includes the eye and that sort of thing. Now, symptoms are going to be blisters, extreme pain, severe itching, and painful urination that can take place. Um, we do see that we have symptomatic treatments that are available. Guys, this is a virus and it's not curable. We're not going to be able to get rid of it. And so all we're doing is we're treating the symptoms. These are going to be with antiviral medications, specifically acyclovir is one of the main medications that they give in order to help prevent the virus from replicating. Sitz baths may be helpful, um, ice therapy, and then of course, painkillers as well. And this shows you that these blisters can be found on the external genitalia in both males and females. 
The next one we see is gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is one of the most common STDs in the United States. It causes inflammation of the mucous membrane of the genital and urinary systems. We see that it is caused by a bacteria. This is called Necessaria gonorrhea, and this bacteria is transmitted again through that sexual contact. However, it can also be transmitted to the baby through if the baby is born through the vaginal canal as well, and that tends to affect the baby's eyes almost more than anything. Symptoms include with gonorrhea, purulent discharge from the penis or vagina, dysuria, which is painful with your painful urination, urinary frequency in both males and females, cervicitis in females. So we see the cervix will actually get really inflamed inflammation and genital itching and burning pain. Now, we also see that with women, especially with gonorrhea and like chlamydial type of infections that something can develop that's called PID, which is pelvic inflammatory disorder um, and disease, which can affect the sterility or affect, it could affect the fertility of a female. It can cause scarring within the pelvic region with the reproductive organs and cause that individual to be infertile and sterile when we talk about females. Now treatment, because this is a bacterial type of infection, we can treat it with antibiotics. Now penicillin is one of the antibiotics of choice, but some people are allergic to penicillin. So we might actually use tetracycline or ceftrioxone. So these are the types of antibiotics that might be utilized. All right, the next one we want to look at is syphilis. Syphilis is a chronic and life-threatening threatening STD. And the reason being is that a lot of times when we talk about um, STDs, they like to stay in the genital areas. Syphilis is not one of those. It likes to migrate to other parts of the body. This is call, caused by Treponium platinum bacteria. So it is a bacterial infection as well. And we do see that symptoms come in three separate stages when we talk about syphilis. So the primary stage, we actually see the development of a painless canker that appears on the actual um, surface that's been infected. This could be the penis. This could be the external structures with the female, with the uvea. It could also be on like the tongue or mouth due to like oral sex, but that's the primary one. That's the thing that happens first. Now, this occurs normally several weeks after contact with somebody who has syphilis. Now, during the secondary kind of stage, we see that the canker will heal up and a rash will start to appear. Now, this is going to happen normally after the canker heals. It might take six months to a year before we see the rash occur. Now, it is important. It is very contagious in the primary stage, and it can be cured if you get the right antibiotic therapy treatment. The problem is, is that if the canker heals up before they get treatment, they think that they're fine and there's not an issue. And then we see that it comes back with a vengeance about six to months to a year later with the secondary set of symptoms. Now, this also creates a lot of mouth sores and the patient is still highly contagious during this stage as well. Treatment when we're talking about the secondary stage is going to be looking at antibiotics. And this again can be cured pretty easily if the proper antibiotic treatment is given. But the tertiary stage is the late or latent stage. This one comes later, and this is a period of rest lasting six weeks to a year again. And then the bacteria starts to invade organs throughout the body, leading to what they call gumma to occur. And a gumma is like a gummy lesion that's found on the surface of like an organ. These can actually cause like aortic aneurysms to occur, heart failure, mental disorders, insanity, deafness, blindness, paralysis, and even death when we're talking about this third stage. Again, curable with antibiotics during this stage, but the effects of the lesions that were already formed on the different organs are irreversible. So we can cure the actual syphilis, but the damage is already done on those organs and that part's not reversible. Now, guys, if you'll look at this particular bacterium, it is a spirochete. It's got the spiral like shape and it is going to be a bacteria that can be treated with penicillin or tetracycline. Those are the two antibiotics normally used to treat syphilis. The next one we want to look at is chlamydia. Chlamydia is very common and it's one of the most damaging STDs out there because it causes a lot of issues with um, scarring in the pelvic area. It's also known as a silent STD because the symptoms tend to be mild or asymptomatic for the most part, especially in females. The cause is a bacteria. We see that 
Symptoms could include drainage from the penis and the vagina, burning and itching of the genital area or with urination, and abdominal pain. Now, guys, this abdominal pain is a lot of times due to that scarring of that pelvic inflammatory disorder. Now, treatment, because this is bacterial, is going to be with antibiotics. Trichomoniasis is the next one. This is a common STD affecting approximately 10% of all sexually active individuals. This one is not caused by a bacteria. It's actually caused by a protozoa. This protozoa is a, a trichomonius vaginalis. And guys, protozoas are a little harder to treat because their cells are very similar to ours. When we talk about bacteria, it's easier to treat them because antibiotics attack them and not us. But these guys, the cells are similar, so treatment is a little bit more difficult. Now, symptoms are going to often be asymptomatic, especially in males because they don't have a vagina and that's where most of the issue comes into play. But they could get inflammation of their urethra. They could get inflammation of the epididymis or the prostate as well. But in females, we tend to, tend to see more issues. They have itching and burning in the genital area. And specifically, one of the main things that lets us know that this infection is present is that they have a vaginal discharge that is green and frothy that takes place. Now, treatment is going to be using antiparasitic types of medications. The next one we have is genital warts. Genital warts is one of the most common STDs as well. And we see that these warts, they affect warm, moist tissues in the genital area. Now, this is due to a virus, which means just like we saw with herpes, it's not curable. Okay, we're not going to be able to get rid of it. We're going to treat the symptoms and we're going to try to keep outbreaks low and far and far and few between if at all possible. Now, when we look at this particular virus... It is caused by the HPV virus. Now, symptoms cause tenderness, discomfort related to the size, location, and number of the warts could take place. And so treatment might be to chemically or surgically remove these warts, just like if you were to get a wart anywhere else on your body that's not aesthetically pleasing or painful, you may need to remove them. But guys, cervical cancer is more common in females if genital warts is present. And this is one of the big things with potentially vaccinating against HPV as well. All right, so this brings us to a little bit of a different topic, which is sexual dysfunction. Now, guys, when we look at sexual dysfunction, it could be a physical issue with this or it could be psychological. There are two different kind of sides of this. Now, the first one. The first one is dyspareunia. Dyspareunia is pain or discomfort with sexual intercourse. This can affect males and females, and it can be caused by physical or psychological conditions. Now, when we look at this, a lot of times it could be due when we're looking in males, it could be due to like penile deformity, presence of an STD. Um, this could also be due to the issue with um, inflammation of any of the structures like the epididymis, or the prostate or anything like that. We also see that this could be when we talk about in women, we see physically it could be due to, again, presence of STDs, bladder infections, pelvic inflammatory disease, or even endometriosis could all cause that pain. However, again, in males and females, there could be a psychological issue, and this could be history of past sexual abuse. It could be due to anxiety, guilt, or even fear of pregnancy that could cause this discomfort. Now, treatment is, of course, dependent on the cause. Um, if the cause is due to to like an infection or inflammation, we could treat those things. Um, there could be surgical um, help if there's like a type of deformity that is present. There could be medications if it's due to like um, an STD. Um, but if it's psychological, the main treatment would be counseling. The next one is female arousal orgasmic dysfunction. This is also known as frigidity. This is a lack of sexual desire or responsiveness in females. The cause is often due to a neurologic condition as well as a psychological issue. 
a lot of times what can happen with this is that we see that they have an inability to reach orgasm, but this could be due also to the inability to have proper vaginal lubrication. It could also cause um, an issue with just sexual arousal in the beginning. And so there's a lot of things that could be looked at for this, whether it's neurological and or psychological. Now treatment, a lot of times it's going to be a physical examination and we may see that if there's another disease or disorder that's complicating this, it could be used with medications or treating that other condition that could be helpful. But education on a healthy sex attitude and sexual stimulation techniques might be the most beneficial for the couple. Um, and so this is again looking at having the right mindset for the female and things like that, but also finding ways that helps stimulate that female as well in order for her to reach arousal as well as potential orgasm. The next two kind of go in together and this is impotence or and or erectile dysfunction or ED. It's most commonly known as ED when we talk about erectile dysfunction, but symptoms include inability of a man to achieve or maintain the erection that's sufficient to complete sexual intercourse. They may be able to have an erection, but then it can't be sustained through the process. Um, this does not affect fertility. Okay, so impotence and erectile dysfunction it has no effect on fertility. Um, but the cause a lot of times is vascular insufficiency, not getting enough blood flow to the penis area, as well as it could also be some psychological factors that are part of this. In order for blood flow and dilation to occur in this area, they have to be relaxed. Okay, there has to be this sense of like safety and relaxation. The parasympathetic system has to be in control. And so if that's not happening due to stress, due to um, guilt or different things like that, it could affect the performance. Now treatment, it varies. Um, there could be a change in some medications that could help, especially with the vasodilation issue. Um, we also see psychological counseling. Surgery may need to be done in some cases in order to open up blood vessels or maybe some implants that may need to be happen with whether it's an internal or external device that might be used. Um, there also are medications like Viagra that could be helpful as well. Now, this may not be preventable, uh, but activities related to healthy lifestyles, as well as helping deal with stress, anxiety, depression, those things can also help to where this might not be as much of an issue or problem. Another issue that could take place is premature ejaculation. This is expulsion of seminal fluid during foreplay prior to completing an erection or immediately after beginning sexual intercourse. This is the most common sexual problem in males, especially young males. So when we talk about all these sexual dysfunctions, this is one of the most common. Now, a cause is usually psychological rather than physical. Now, treatment with premature ejaculation is based on the cause. It could include things like sex therapy and also education. And these different educations are going to be helping with techniques to help delay ejaculation from occurring. The next one we want to look at is infertility. Infertility is the inability of a couple to achieve pregnancy. This could be caused by the male, female, or both. So when we look at female causes of infertility, this could be presence of an STD, um, hormonal disorders could be an issue, and this is actually probably one of the most common causes. Abnormalities in reproductive organs, endometriosis, scarring or blockage of the fallopian tubes, and that's a lot of times due to complications of the STDs when we talk about pelvic inflammatory disease, or vaginal antibodies that actually kill sperm. Sperm is technically a foreign invader in the female, and so she could be producing antibodies that take out the sperm before the sperm has the chance to even find the egg. Male infertility could be due to presence of an STD or other infection within the urinary or reproductive tract. There could be some structural abnormalities or even hormonal disorders as well. Now, treatment could be surgery. Uh, medications to correct hormonal imbalances could occur. Fertility drugs, like doing fertility cycles, we call that like IVF. And then we also could do inseminations that could be helpful, where we take the female or take the sperm from the male and implant it with artificial insemination, where they can do in vitro fertilization as well.
Now, some prevention for infertility. Smoking increases your risk for infertility, so not smoking. Being careful what you drink or how much you drink could also be helpful. Eating a healthy diet. Avoid excessive exercise, especially in males, because that can cause low sperm count to occur. We also see checking with your physician to ensure that any medications, including herbal remedies, are not affecting your fertility. Avoid STDs. And then also maintaining proper body weight And having a healthy lifestyle can help reduce potential hormone imbalances. It doesn't mean it will for sure, but it could potentially help with that. All right, this brings us to trauma. One of the main traumas when we talk about the reproductive system is rape. This is sexual intercourse, vaginal or anal, without consent and against the will of the individual. This may be at any age and it can be against either sex, males or females. There is actually a very high incidence of rape. A lot of it, though, goes unreported. Date rape drugs are out there which cause the individual to be incapacitated and they don't realize everything that is going on. A lot of times with this trauma, it has a difficult recovery. It can affect that person for the rest of their life. Not only could there be potential like damage physically, there's definitely a lot of emotional and psychological damage that comes along with this type of trauma. All right, some rare diseases that are part of the reproductive system include vaginal cancer. This is rare form of cancer that occurs in daughters of mothers who've used a certain type of hormone. This is the diethyl silbestrol hormone or DES hormone. Uh, Treatment here would be surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And so again, this would be a combination treatment to help with preventing this cancer from metastasizing and removing as much as possible. Purple sepsis is the next one. This is inflammation or sorry, infection of the endometrium following childbirth. Okay, so this is where they get an infection of the endometrium layer, which is the inner layer of the uterus after childbirth. Treatment here is for antibiotics. Prevention is using asepsis during and in and after childbirth. This just means guys using proper aseptic type of techniques, keeping things clean. Um, This was actually the leading cause of death of most women back when women died from childbirth most of the time. And this is because of infections that occurred because they didn't wash their hands between patients or before they actually delivered the baby, let alone they didn't wear gloves. And so now we know this kind of stuff. And so using aseptic techniques and keeping things clean helps prevent this. Okay. And that's why it's more considered rare now versus when it was commonplace way back before modern medicine. The next one's a hydididiform mole. This is a grape-like cyst that happens in the uterus and it mimics a pregnancy. Okay, so it's gonna mimic symptoms of a pregnancy, but it's not a pregnancy. Now treatment here is DNC, so they have to go in and actually scrape this out of the uterus and the endometrium. Higher risk of developing chirocarcinoma, and this is gonna require frequent follow-up examinations to make sure that it did not develop into cancer because this tissue is is abnormal already. The last thing we want to look at is effects of aging, and we're going to look at effects of aging on females and then males. What happens to the reproductive system in females as they age? Well, we see that there's a thinning and graying of the pubic hair that occurs. Decreased elasticity and atrophy of the vagina starts to happen. Shrinking of the internal organs, especially the ovaries, because they they stop producing during menopause their hormones and even eggs. And so since they're not being used, they start to shrink and atrophy. Decreased vaginal lubrication, so this causes intercourse to be more difficult and more painful as they age. Greater stimulation and lubricants are required for sexual pleasure, and this is a lot due to the hormone levels being decreased. And we also see that that older women tend to start to have breast atrophy as well. In males, the effects that occur with aging are decreases in testosterone and sperm count, decreasing in the size of the testes. Again, they're not being used as much. And so because of that, they decrease in size, decreased elasticity of the penis and the scrotum, thinning and graying also of the pubic hair, greater stimulation required for erection, diminished ejaculation amount, And a large prostate. And guys, with the enlarged prostate, it causes more issues with urination than it does with the reproductive system. However, remember the prostate, though, is a gland that helps produce the fluid for semen. And so that's why it's listed here with the reproductive system. All right, so this finishes up the reproductive system notes over diseases and disorders. So again, if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. (laughs) 